Welcome to the Oxygen Advantage podcast with your host, Oxygen Advantage founder, Patrick McKeown. With the Oxygen Advantage podcast, we aim to show how functional breathing is an essential part of a healthy and well-balanced lifestyle. Each episode, we meet experts in their field from around the world and talk about their lives, their experiences, and how they learned the importance of breathing. Join us and get inspired. Get the Oxygen Advantage. So Michael Conlon, an interview, and I'd like to get inside the mind of this man. Michael is a boxer for those of you who are international. He's a household name in Ireland. And I think you've had 20 fights with 18 wins. So you've yeah. got quite a significant record. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kick off with the first question. You're 31 years of old, 31 years of age. You're from the north of Ireland. Yeah. And... Um, what got you into boxing? So how how does one fall into boxing? Well, in Belfast, there's a boxing club on almost every corner. And uh, for me, I just wanted to be like my older brothers. And, and they them two were sent to the gym. I, was four bro- we have, I have four brothers and two older and one younger. And the two older ones were sent to the gym to learn how to defend themselves. And it was the oldest one I always wanted to be like my brother, Jamie. He's now actually my manager. Um, so I, I just followed them to the gym and I kept going to the gym and I remember the coach in the gym at the time, I was only seven years of age, the coach shared it and says, he needs to get out, he's too young. Now you meant to be nine is the youngest or 10 is the youngest you can be here. He's too young. And I cried in the eyes. Like, and then so I went and joined. It. I loved it. Cause I, it's just not that I loved the boxing. It was just, I enjoyed the boxing. I enjoyed the, the thought of everything and the muchness of it all. And, um, I like playing up to things, but I just wanted to be like my older brother, and that was it. There was it was nothing else but that. I wanted to impress him, and show him how good I could be. So I just kept going just to try and be like him. And then when they kicked me out, I ended up having uh, when I left that club's over the north side of Belfast, we're from the west. I ended up joining a, a local boxing club, uh, to where where I lived, Clonard Boxing Club, and uh, I went there. They took me in. They took on all ages. So I went there and I was flying and I was like sparring and stuff and I I, I picked it up really quick. D- different than my other two brothers, I picked it up much quicker. Um, and then I had like a little club show, a little mess of a fight and, and the coach of the club at the time, Sean McCaffrey, he was there and he rang, rang the house and says, tell him he has to come to the club. He has to join. He has to come back to us. He's not allowed, he's not allowed to be in that club now. So, I was happy. It was just I'll go and go back and train my brothers and I. So I went back and you know that's where that's where I, I stayed for the majority of my career, uh, my amateur career, and then towards the end, a bit of you know how things get in in, in clubs, you no know, disagreements and stuff, and I ended up leaving and joining in the first club I, I actually boxed for there. Uh, towards the end of my career, and you know I ended up still winning everything I won. So. Um, and they got the accolades, which is uh, which is lovely. It's cool. And did you have? Is there any mentor that kind of stood out for you? Like, was there one? So, because sometimes I think I feel we need to come across one individual when we're growing up, and that person can kind of identify with us and say the right things to drive us forward. Did it happen to you, or was there a number of people? It was quite a number of people. My whole family, really, but. So Jamie's the oldest, Brendan is second, oldest. I'm third. Me and Brendan, we didn't get on too much because we were both in the middle. So we always, it was always a competition between us and he never let me do good. But if, if there's one mentor, it would have been Jamie because he was always the one, even when I was kids, just saying, like, I remember him like, doing the result saying, uh, he's the best at all of us. He's, he's unbelievable. He's better than us and stuff. And always bigging me up. And the brother in between is always like, he's not better than me. And, a little bit of back and forth from me and him, but he always just kind of built me up and uh, and gave me a, a real like, kind of self belief in myself. And, and my mum as well. She was she was fantastic at that. You know, she she was reading the secret before anybody was reading the secret and telling me I need to do this and do that. And she was always like saying positive things and um kind of just in, instilling that inner resilience and inner self confidence. So it's cool. So your mother was reading the secret. That's the book that was put out there by I think Ron the Burn back in the yeah, day. Yeah, 
Yeah. Wow. Yes, it, it, it was it was a really long time ago, and I know over the last load of years it's got really popular again. Um, but I think it was when it only came out she was reading it, and and I was like, I used to be like, oh, whatever, whatever, and she was like, no, like say it, and it'll happen, and all this here, and obviously there needs to be action behind that. You can't just say things and happen. Um, so I was doing the action, but and then I was believing in it as well, and knowing knowing things as well, and I think like when I won the the world championships and still still the only Irish man ever to win the world championships in the in the amateur boxing uh system, and when I when I done that, I was already I, I remember on the on the the, the week of the fight or the, it was the world championships, so it was loads of fights. But I remember the day before the fight, and I was just saying, I'm already I'm already world champion. I'm just going to to pick up the title. I'm already already had the kind of self confidence, self belief in my head, and I kind of put it down to reading that book, but. Obviously, reading the book helps, but you need to add in, you know, the action, and and that was one thing I was doing was adding in the action and putting the work in. Yeah, it's really interesting. Do you ever feel that life sometimes directs you in certain ways? Because you obviously were pretty aligned with boxing. Do you mm. ever think that sometimes things fall into place, and it's because of your alignment, like? You know, people might be saying, "Well, I'm going to be world champion." Of course, you can say it easily in your head, but it doesn't mean yeah. doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, yeah. have have things fallen into place for you? I think so. You know, I remember when I was sixteen, they got they got these rosaries tattooed on seventeen. Mm. So just turned set sixteen or seventeen. I remember I told my dad I was going to get the rose the, the rosaries tattooed. And he says, "I don't know where to get it because I was told the neck is too sore, so I might get them around my arm or something, or get them somewhere else." I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. He didn't think that I would go and get them or anything because he was like, you'd be too, too afraid. So I went and I asked to get the, the tattooist, I says, tattoo artist, he says, like, I, I want them around the neck, but I was told it's too sore. And he says, if you want them around the neck, don't get it anywhere else because you'll regret it. And I was like, all right, so I'd get it around the neck. But I remember coming in after that and my dad just commented, what the hell have you done? Says you're never. It was at the time when tattoo, tattoo show and stuff. People weren't getting jobs and stuff. You're never going to get a job now. You fucking idiot! All this year, I was just what are you on? I was like, started to like well up and cry a wee bit. I was like, I'm, I don't need a job. I'm going to be a boxer. <laughs> so I'd already said it from there, and I had to follow through with it, obviously, because I had the tattoo. So yeah. So you you were you're obviously very spiritual, Michael. You like mm-hmm. in terms of that, and sometimes I often feel that. There's a loss of the spirituality, whether one goes with institutionalized religion or not, but something in that there's a being outside of us. And Katie Taylor's falls into the same space as well. Do you, what, how, why? I, I, I would be religious, but I wouldn't be, you know, Katie's a very devoted Christian and and, and very much, you know, practicing stuff every day. And I wouldn't say I'm, 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 I'm 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 a I'm a Catholic and and I wouldn't say I'm a, a full on practicing Catholic because I'm not I can't say here I'll be I'll be lying I'll be telling I'll be I'll be sinning right now if I was uh to say that but I always just you know believed in you know God higher power everything um and I don't believe we're put on this earth for 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 like just to flow through it there's a purpose and I believe I definitely have a purpose and. You know, I believe in heaven and hell, everything like that. You know, as it says, I'm a Catholic, so I believe everything kind of in the Catholic kind of religion. And there's obviously some resolve there because you've got a very tough job too. You're going into a ring, which like the vast majority, I would say, 99.95% of people would never do in their wildest dreams. You need to have some connection or some faith in something yeah. that it's going to be okay. Hundred percent. Every time before I go into the ring, I always say a prayer, and I don't pray to win. I don't pray and ask and help me out here. And I always pray for the protection of myself and, and my opponent. Um, because really, I don't think people understand the dangers of boxing. Really, um, it's it's it can be life and death in there, and and you can get seriously damaged and hurt. Um, so I always just pray for the health and safety of of, of me and my opponent. Boxers are nice people. In general, the, the the people that I met, and very often, like so, you were coming from Northern Ireland. It was a yeah. tough place. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and probably, do you think boxing actually brought a certain calmness to it because young boys growing up, they had a purpose in boxing. Well, 
I grew up with the tail end of the troubles. I, I, I was born in 91. I think the key for it was 96 or 97. Um, but like I remember growing up and, and you seen like the soldiers, British soldiers and stuff patrolling the streets. And that was normal. You know, if now if we look, you don't see that now, but if you look and go Afghanistan or somewhere like that and you see the soldiers, that was Belfast and, and the North really for a long time. Um, so I think there's like, there's definitely... It's definitely hard, and I think you know, like a lot of the stuff with the mental health stuff in in the north is is generational trauma coming through, all that stuff probably, um, but yeah, but that that was normal, and I think that you know boxing just made it made it easier, and you know, boxing in a sense saved me from a lot of things. You know, I got up to no good through it, like from the ages of like eleven to sixteen, like doing things where if I had been caught, I know that. Like my dad or or my brothers would have killed me, um, taking drugs to an order and like I was only young, but like because we grew up in West Belfast, uh, a very depraved area, and you know it's what 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 like is is very big in the very areas is drugs isn't it? and and stuff like that, drugs and crime, and you know for me, boxing kind of sheltered me enough. I w- I was obviously Dublin, but it sheltered me and sheltered me enough and made sure that I always. Because I always had to be in the gym. I couldn't miss the gym. I was one of the coaches in the gym, and I couldn't not be at the gym. So I couldn't be getting up to the bad stuff where they were always getting up to. I always had to kind of shoot off and go go training. So, yeah, boxing boxing helped me out throughout my life. Um, it's a really tough place in West Belfast. Um, but it also like you know we grew up in a a, a split kind of con- country in a sense. You know, Catholic Protestant. Boxing brings everybody together, and in the, in in the north especially, I got most of my friends. A lot of my friends in boxing are, are Protestants, um, not most of them, but a lot of them, um, and you know that was boxing. You know, I, I'm from the other side. I would never have like if it wasn't for boxing, I never would associate with people from from the Protestant areas growing up because there's a wall to vagueness and gates to vagueness. Um, so the fact that we have boxing brings you together and lets you that lets you to see. You're exactly like me, only a different religion, which nobody really cares about in a sense. So, what's the point? No, that's that's but that's boxing. Yeah, it's amazing, and I can understand as well how kids would get tied up. Even the small village I grew up in, we seen everything. It's very easy yeah. to get involved when you're a young kid. And that's yeah. part of the reason why I live in the middle of nowhere, and I know you've yeah. been out here. Yeah, I purposely removed our service from it because. I figured I didn't want my own children to be exposed to it. And of course, not everybody is, is in the position to yeah. be in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. You know, and I can also feel for the young kids growing up sometimes is that you can't really choose who you're going to hang around with. You have to hang around with everybody because otherwise you you are the one that will get, you know, you're the one that's kind of standing out a bit. Um, do you think that the coaches, because I'm always fast, I think Belfast is a, Mm. Super city. And, you know, I've been there on quite a few occasions with Sinead as well. We've always had a great time. And I think it's so much going forward. But I wonder, did the coaches, did they realise what they were doing in terms of bringing peace between young kids growing up by mixing? Mm. And do you think that that ever came into their minds? Yeah, or? yeah I do. I do. And I think one of the most famous coaches for that would be Jerry Story in, in Holy Family, which... Is in North Belfast, uh, in the new, at the, on the New Lodge, but just like border and Tigers Bay, and he would have had Protestant kids come in train the club, and you know, when you're living for me living in West Belfast, we weren't close to like our gyms weren't close to like Protestant gyms or anything or Protestant uh, Protestant areas, so it wasn't really divided in that sense. But um, when you go to the competitions and all, that's where you kind of mingle and, and interact with other fighters and other people and. You know, that's kind of where we did, but like Jerry Story, for years before I was born and stuff, he was one of the the Irish Olympic coaches and stuff throughout the years, and you know he uh he always brought people together. I think he's got like a an OBE or something or one of them kind of awards from from Britain because of it. You know he's he's done that well for the for the community and the people of of the north. So he was able to do something that politicians were struggling to do at the time. You know. Yeah, he was. He was. He was. Bring kids in from each side of the areas, and like I know that the car and others from both sides were like going okay. 
he can he let will let will let this happen because of him kind of thing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Irish people, how come boxing has become our sport? Have you have you ever thought about that? Like it's 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 a sport that we seem to excel in. I can't think yeah. of it. We certainly don't excel in soccer. Um we're okay, rugby pretty good. But yeah. boxing is the one that stands out. Do you, yeah. do you think on a world class level, do you think there's something in the Irish psyche or have you ever thought about it? Yeah, I think it's, you know, being colonialized by Britain for a long time and having that kind of fade in as the fight back and you know, that kind of something to prove. Um situation especially in Belfast as well with that you know that's that's massive up there I think and you know I think we've always been a, a sm- like we're one of the smallest countries you know in, in, in world boxing who do so well but we have so much faith in us for being such a small country you know I mean I think that's just like us I, I like I, I'm I'm short so I always say it's we're all, we're all small in Ireland <laughs> and we just have small man syndrome or something but no we're we're a very good fighting country especially for the says. And I know when the amateurs and stuff they used to call us the Cubans of Europe because Cuba is obviously very small too, um. But they pr- produce the best boxers, and that's what we were doing in Europe. So, um, yeah, we're we are a small country, but we're fighting. We always have something to prove. I think a chip on a shoulder kind of thing. But even you know, outside of Ireland as well, like there was always talk that different professions, different nationalities went into different professions in New York, and if you were Irish, you either became a policeman. Yeah. Or you become a boxer, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, it's yeah. mad, isn't it? It's mad, yeah. I often wonder, and it comes back to what you were talking about, trauma. Yeah. And the environment that we're growing up in, that I think it does be passed down generation, and it may even be passed down to DNA, I don't know, like, you know, who knows. Um, in terms of you, nature, natural ability versus hard work, and also if you were working with a young kid. Yeah. What do you think? What what are the qualities? What are the ingredients that make somebody to reach that high level? I think no matter how naturally talented you are, if you don't work hard, you're not going to achieve a quarter of what you can. Um, for me, I wouldn't say I'm I'm naturally talented. Um, I pick things up quick enough. Because I, I work hard and, and one thing about me is and I, I ask anybody who trains me, they'll tell you I I'll train like non stop. I, I push myself. I, I'm the kind of guy who needs a coach to tell him to stop training because I, I, I wanna push myself so I just wanna make sure I do everything. Um and I think that comes from probably a fear of losing. I don't I don't like losing. So I always try to do everything I possibly can. Did not put myself in that position. It's probably my own detriment at times because, you know, I probably overdo it. I, I, I think you definitely have in a few in a few of my fights. I've probably overtrained. Um, I'm not saying that with the ones lost, just in general. Um, but I think you need definitely hard work. Talent is good, and I have talent. You know, if you have that extra bit of talent, that's a little special bit of natural talent. Fantastic, but. You can still achieve whatever you want to achieve if you if you work hard enough, I believe. And alignment. Would you ever have seen yourself doing anything else? Is this your sport? Nah, this this is what I always would have done. Um, this is what I always would have done. I always knew that, you know, I, I was gonna be a boxer from you know, when I started. I knew that I was gonna be a professional boxer and stuff and that's how I would earn money in life. And I, I could have knew that from a young age and believed that from a young age. So that's probably what happened because I had that belief. I I like growing up, like I'm thirty one now, as I say, but like the years of like seventeen until probably twenty probably now, even now, like I missed so much in, in, in life in terms of events, like going out when you're younger and stuff, you have to yeah, like you just have to sacrifice things like that. So I've sacrificed loads of stuff growing up. I've missed like birthdays, weddings, my kid, my own kids' birthdays, um, you know, christening, all the events, all the events you can think of. I've missed them all at some stage, and you know, nights out, holidays away, I've missed loads. Even family holidays with my own kids, I've missed because I've been in training. And I think you know, I know that sport is a short career, so if you can give it your all for a certain amount of time, once it's done, it's done. You, know, you can move on, do whatever you want to do, and try everything you want to try. Um, 
But I think, you know, if you really want to be successful, you got to sacrifice. And also you've got a broader agenda too, you know, when one has family and kids, you want to really do whatever you can for them. If you were giving advice to your kids growing up, and I'm only just thinking about, say, somebody who's listening to this, and I think very often, like, I was lucky I found something that really suits me. But I think the vast majority of people don't find careers that suit them, that they go into something. What would you say to your kids? Have you thought about it? I have them in every sport you could think of. Bar boxing. I don't have them on boxing. I've done <laughs> boxing. I don't want them to do boxing. But I've had them in every I have them in every sport already, and my kids are eight and five. And I just want them to do whatever makes them happy. You know, and, and I know the sport is fantastic for, 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 for making you happy one, but learning so much life skills and, and and things that even career skills, um, for whatever you choose to do after sport. Like I just want them to go in things to learn, get confidence. You know, I, my daughters are already super confident. Um, but it, like just go in things, interact with other kids, play, be competitive, and I I think both of my kids are very much like me. They're very very competitive and they hate to lose. And even even when I play games with them, I don't let them win because they know how competitive they are. But I want that. I want to build it. And I want to see them like do their best to win. So, um. Yeah, just go into something, you know, for for me, go into something, find something you, you love to do and whatever it is, whether it's sport, whether it's business or anything like that, it all applies. Just try, try to find something you love. I know it's very hard to do and you know, not many people do, as, as we just said, but, you know, if you can, you're on the goal, you're on the, some gold there. Like. Mm, I think the education system, I don't think it does enough to find out no. what kids are suited no. for. <laughs> You don't learn about things you need to know in life. You don't learn about money. You don't learn about paying taxes. You don't learn about business, anything like that. It's, you know, you, you, you learn a lot of stuff that you probably will never use. And and you're getting tested and things you probably never use. They should probably try to teach more things about, you know, how to use money, how to earn money, how to, how to like, do things in life, how to enjoy life, how to be happy. Loads of little things like that. How to breathe. You know, so all, all things like that. I think there's so much more the education system could do, but obviously I'm not in a position to tell them what to do. But that's that's my opinion. No, but I think you're so right mm. because you've learned the life skills. You didn't necessarily, you know, you you learned them out there. Um, I I would totally agree with you. People come out of school, they come out of university, they come out of a business degree. Even Michael, they don't know how to deal with stress. No. You know, they haven't been taught how to self-regulate. They mm. haven't been taught how to, you know, bring down a heart rate or slow down everything before going into a competition. Like you're getting out in front of, I don't know what, what was Madison Square Garden, that hype, even in yeah. your first debut yeah. fight. Five, five or six thousand people right away in that Madison Square Garden theater soul taking out there and experiencing that, the pressures of that and everything. You, It's, it's something that you can't, it's experience you can't you can't get anywhere else. So, yeah, it's I suppose experience and, and life experience is a big benefit of being a sportsman. Oh, it's huge. You you talked about happiness a few times. What makes Michael Connell happy? My kids, my kids, and seeing them happy. Now, there's a fame point there because you got to be careful not to spoil them and they like, do too much for them. Um, but when I see them happy and see them doing things they love that's what I'm happy and probably the balance there is the sports because I see it with my own like I bring her hurling as much as I can yeah. you know yeah. and I love it because I feel that she's out there and she's getting stuck in and yeah. you can kind of see a little bit of yourself in your child yeah. out in the you know it's it's cool yeah I like my daughter she's playing Gaelic football with a minute um, and I went to watch her I brought her to Matt she done a blitz the other day and like she's small. Like when I was a kid, I was I was when I was uh ten, I was still only twenty seven kilos. You know what I mean? So I was very small. Um, so she's small. Maybe I was she's probably bigger than me when I was that age. But um, she's just so competitive and and like because she's small as well, she tries to get in even more. And she's like playing for the year above now. Um, and she's just like lightning and she just doesn't care she'll go in and she's trying to slap the ball out and people are turning around trying to slap her and stuff and she's just getting into them and going on and scoring points and 
Yeah, she's she's very very competitive, and and when I was watching her the other day, I was just like, oh, I, I have a fast up competitive bug on. <laughs> That's cool because yeah. I suppose there's something in it. You must be very proud when you look back at what you have achieved, and like you know when we try and push ourselves a little bit, there's something inherently rewarding that we've gone out regardless of what we do, and we said to ourselves, we've given our best shot. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, I don't look back too much, but when I do, I do sit and when I when I have sat and thought about it, I've been I've been blown away by what it is, and you know, you go, I've done that, but like you think about that, like the world we live in now, I suppose it doesn't really matter for people. It's just a blink, and and they move on to the next thing, isn't it? Really? They're, oh, they're, I think it's um, tremendous for people, Michael. Yeah. I think yeah. for a country, you know, yeah. like you know, in terms of. I was out there in, in the Belfast Arena to see thousands of people. That's mm. a mental, that's a therapy session for them. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. genuinely, like, I don't often feel that sometimes, you know, when you are able to put yourself out there and people are watching and they're fully mm. absorbed and they they were fully absorbed. Like, yeah. that's getting them out of their mundane life, many of them. And mm-hmm. it's putting them on a, on a pedestal that, yes, here's a local person here. They are fighting in front of me. And I think there's something huge in it. I think the the mental health benefits that sports can bring to the spectators because it's, they have a passion, even though yeah. they're not the ones in the ring. And sometimes the one, you know, they're outside of it. But, yeah, I think that's important, you know, for you to take into consideration. Ah, oh, it's something that, like I was just saying, I don't really sit and dwell or, or sit and think on things like achievements and stuff. You know, the odd time I will, but, you know, the one that obviously will always stand out is, is the World Championships. When I, won, when I won the World Championships as an amateur, but even then, like, like, talk about living in the moment and trying to enjoy the moment. Like, I just won the World Championships, the first and only Irish man ever to do it at that time. Still the only, only one, but I remember... I got put down in the last round. And I got up and I, I won the fight. Wow. And I was more embarrassed that I was down in the third round than actually creating history. Like, looking back on the corner, I, was, um, say, I say to myself, why did I let that ruin that moment for me? Because in a sense, it did. Now, everything after, like a few days out, I didn't care. But in the moment, I was more upset about that. I was just annoyed. I remember sitting there before getting the medal and I was just embarrassed. I was like, fuck's sake. Oh, first time ever on TV, for fuck's sake. But, you know, when you look back on it, you go, why did I get behave like that? But it doesn't really matter because I've enjoyed the success from it and, and it was it was fantastic and it kind of sent me to a different stratosphere in terms of popularity at home and stuff. Like, that was the year I won the, the RT Sports Awards and stuff and um, it was because of that, you know, being the first and only one ever, especially how long we've had amateur boxing going on in the country, you know, to be the be the, be the only one ever to do it is is kind of probably my proudest moment. You do, were you on flow state? Can you remember it? How did you? How did it feel? When when I went down? No, no, no. In oh. the in the overall like between the during the rounds, for example. During the rounds, I uh, like uh, uh, it was. I went out with a game plan in that fight and the game plan was the boxing move and I knew within the first 10 seconds that I wasn't going to be able to do that. I had to stand and fight the guy because he was too like aggressive coming forward and like throwing too much punches. So the only way I could like be able to keep him off was just to meet him at his, his own game and beat him at his own game. And that's what I done. I won the first round, I won the second round and I just I had one then, so I just needed to move the last round, just went easy. But I got greedy, <laughs> and then I went and like tried to do something 23 set, 25 seconds left on the club, and I threw something. The guy just like counted me with a check hook, and um, I, I went down on the one knee, the wee knee, the kid went wobbly. Went, what the fuck happened there? <laughs> I stood up, and then I was just like, look, the, the corner it was Billy Walsh in the corner of the team, he said, get close, get close. And, First thing I done was the guy just like kind of tried to steam me and I just put my hands up and went straight in close to him and just tightened up and then just started letting my hands go and obviously the bell was, was on the way, thank God, and I got the win. Because you would think maybe that 
an opponent if he comes out too aggressive? Is there a risk that an opponent can tire themselves out? Yeah, always, always. But there was twenty three seconds left on the clock. But he's, uh, I knew that with him, he, uh, the seen his face throughout the championships, and 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 he was able to maintain it for for that amount of time. And you know, I think that with him doing it and him expecting me to to move. I kind of ruined his game plan because I I stayed on, and it was a uh, that was just a split decision in my own head um, to be able to switch it up and you know uh, that's probably something I need to get back to is just making my own kind of decisions there. It it kind of reminds me of that quotation that everybody knows from Mike Tyson. Yeah, <laughs> everybody has a plan until you get a, a box yeah. in the nose. Yeah, exactly. So you were able to change it though. But that's yeah. that again is life because you know yeah. like even in business you know the you'd be writing out a business plan I've never written a business plan because I've never any idea where anything is going yeah. and sometimes it's nice that we have to kind of go with the yeah go, go with the, the flow. moves go with the yeah. flow yeah and yeah. um, I always remember and I'm sure everybody in Ireland remembers that decision I think it was yeah. the 2016 Summer Olympics yeah. and. You spoke your mind, which many of us would admire you. Can you just talk about that? Yeah. Or do you feel comfortable talking about I'm it? I'm comfortable talking about it. It's no problem at all. Um, yeah, when I look back on it now, I think it was probably the best thing that happened in my career um, was that, and it really benefited me. But, you know, I knew the team before that, you know, I, I, in the qualification for the Olympics the year before and stuff, I've been screwed over by the organisation, which was AIBA, who I think are actually getting boxed and kicked their Olympics because they're corruption already. And, you know, I, I don't like to say you're welcome, but, you know, you're welcome in that sense Um, for calling it out. But they, they there were so much decisions in, throughout my amateur career when, when, when you've lost, and you're going, how did I lose that? I didn't lose that, but, Obviously, there's different hands at play, and one of them happened. And I remember the fight actually qualified in Fort Venezuela in WSB, which was like semi pro at the time. Uh, but it was like a qualification route for the Olympics through AIBA and five rounds, no head guards, no vest. Sorry. And uh, my kind of hopes, because I got screwed over, were kind of over. I needed one fight. Who the guy was at the top of the thing to lo- for him to lose against someone who I already had beat, um, and beat him well. I stopped the guy, and I was like, "There's no chance. It's not gonna happen." Uh, after this fight, because they fucked me over, I'm just gonna go fuck you guys. I'm going pro. But the f- I I went into the fight. I I remember saying the the coach and sort of thing. I'm just gonna go and try and knock this guy. Out. And the coach was like, "What are you doing? Don't be doing that. Just box. Just do what you have to do." He says, "Nah." Fuck it, I'm done anyway, so I'm just going to try and knock him out. So I went into the fight against a Venezuelan in Venezuela, in Caracas or Cacris in, in Venezuela, and it was just felt the, the stadium was filled, and it was like all people from the favelas, and they were all just going, Venezuela, Venezuela. And I went into the fight, and I tried to knock the guy out. They hit me shot in the first round. And I remember he hit me on top of the head, and my leg kicked out. It kicked out the way, and I was like, what the fuck happened there? I was all right, though. So, I won that round. I won that won the fight, but it was a war. I get I gave myself a really really hard fight, um, against someone who who could have really been easy if I really wanted to, but I wanted to try and have a fight and prove a point. But because it was a war and because the crowd was so amazing, shit in Venezuela, I just says, you know what, fuck it, I have to clap clap the crowd, and I clapped the crowd. Lo and behold, Paddy Barnes runs around the corner and says, "You've qualified. You qualified. The other guy lost." And then the qualifying, so thank God I didn't do it that time. But um, I suppose again, everything happens for a reason. Um, so that brought me to the Olympics, and you know I already had that planned a year before I was going to do it. So that's probably why it happened there in the Olympics. I didn't know it was going to happen that day because I was, I was, I went to them games saying that I'm already Olympic champion. I'm getting against. I, I, I kind of in my head, I, not in my head. I said it to the guys in the team. This is how I, I want to fight first. I'll fight this guy, fight this guy, fight this guy. And I kind of laid out the way which I had, I had thought it would be when the draw was made. I was like, it's, it's written. This is written. Um, so I went into the fight and I didn't know none, but the coaches were told the night before or two days before, after my quarter or my last 16 win, 
they were told, go get some help by one of the Russian coaches who was a friend with uh, Zoran, the, the, the Georgian coach in Ireland. And he says, go get some help. Your boy is not going to win. He says, our boy will, will destroy your boy. He's, he's much better. And he says, it's out of our, it's out of, it's not, it's not in his control. Go get some help. So they asked, they rang around, they rang Pat Hickey, but I think he was being arrested at the time. Um, and they were trying to get help. And then the candy came back to it. It's too late. Sorry. And uh, went into the fight. I didn't know anything. I wasn't told nothing. I went into the fight and I destroyed him in the first round. I came back to the corner and, and the scores were given down that I lost the first round. And then I wanted to go to Lane and I said, you need to go fucking knock him out. They're trying to cheat you. So obviously I went in, went to war, almost had him out in the second and then destroyed him so on the third and, and they can get the decision. Like I didn't, I still didn't know what, what they had been told. Um, one second, let me end this call. Um, sorry, I just got a caller. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know what the coach had been told. I just uh, I reacted how how I reacted, and I just get the fingers. Um, took my vest off. I wasn't going to leave the ring. I didn't want to leave the ring, but then for some reason I did. And I remember walking past the judges, and uh, and like for me, one of the most disgusting things of anything is spitting and spitting on people and all that. And that was how close I was, because that's one of the most vulgar things you could do to someone spit on them, I think. But I was that close to spitting on one of the judges, like walking past, and I, was, I wanted to slap them on spit on them. And then I'm walking towards the media. BBC just says, nope, we don't want him. We don't want him. They, they, they waved me off. RT were just like, come on, get him in, get him in. And then I went in and they the there. Media training guy was there, and no, all that's why I actually say during an interview, I don't, I don't give a fuck if I'm cursing on TV because he was standing there and I was saying it so he knew what I, what I meant. Um, and then you know, I said what I had to say, and if you look at towards the end of the interview, I start to get more emotional because it starts to set in more. And, and then I finish and I walked out in this room and just cried me eyes out, cried me eyes out. And it's a terrible heart- situation, though, it's, you yeah. know, it's, and you were so, I like you were so right. Yeah, all of the years of work that a young kid is putting into boxing, mm. and there's corrupt judges there who are who are wanting to take it away. Yeah. But I find it amazing that the Georgian um coach yeah. knew what was happening. Like it's absolutely yeah. unbelievable. This is only in 2016, you know. Yeah, well, they were told, and and they reached out to so many people, and obviously trying to reach out to the Irish delegates and stuff, but they were uh you know occupied, but. Um, and then it came back, but it was too late. And unfortunately, you know, things happen where it happened. But would I change it now when I look back on it? No, I wouldn't, because a lot of other people have won gold in their them Olympics have been on my undercards. And and that's the thing. Like it's it, it shot me to kind of superstar them worldwide. Like my like Twitter and all went from like, you know, like 15k they're like 100 and something or 200 and some whatever it is on now um instagram went from like 12 20 to like you know 100 and 200 or something i don't know what's up but it went really high everything went really high really quick and and then i done the silly thing of, of tweeting putin i tweeted putin how much did you pay them bro and when i done it it got like so much traction on social media i half regret it then i was like some cunt's going to hit me with an umbrella and I'm just going to dash on there. I shit myself. I was like, oh, why did I do that? But I suppose when you're in the moment, you just do things. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise about that one. That's, a, that's funny. Um, yeah, and you know what? The other thing then, it could be a little bit of a head wreck afterwards when, we, when, we, when something we do something in the spur of the moment. I think you're so right. Yeah. In a bit of research about a year ago, I was just kind of going through it and I was going through what did people and how did they feel with it? Because especially for an inter- international group of people that will be listening to this, the comments were very favorable towards you because they knew that you had been robbed. And, yeah. you know, and you were you stood up. I think it was the best thing ever you did was stand up. There would there would be so many people that they would be trained to be absolutely pol- politically correct there and yeah. it would do nothing to change the situation. Do you think the situation has changed a little or that you might have had some impact 
in terms of highlighting corruption in amateur boxing? Yeah, well, they done a, a big investigation um, on it, and and it was kind of proved in that investigation that there was corruption going on. But we can't prove which every fight was what, what fights were corrupt. But these are the fights that we think were corrupt, and my fights obviously in there, and there's other fights in there, and um, yeah, I think you know it kind of it shook up that whole organization of of Aiba and you seen like the judges and stuff of of different of the next few competitions after that, everything was much better and stuff. And I think even the last Olympics, the judging was much more fair. Um, but now nah, they've kind of they make a kick to the Olympics and uh, and boxing might be kicked to the Olympics, but if not, you know the Olympics will 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 hold on the boxing and run it themselves. Rather than kick at the whole organ, kick at the whole sport, and um, that's what I think is going to happen in Paris. I think you know, uh, the Olympic Council is gonna is gonna run the the boxing event, and you know I think that's a good thing. Um, I think these dinosaurs and corrupt people in 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 amateur boxing have been there for so long, and something needs to change. And you know, you see a lot of different, you know, organizations. Organization to be informed and now and the likes of USA, I think Ireland have joined, UK have joined. That this new kind of organization was to try and bring in to take over from that last one. Wow. Okay. Um. How do you handle the feats psychologically? Uh, psychologically, it's hard. It's hard. It's one of the hardest things I've dealt with in in life, really. Um. You know, the fact that, like, in the amateurs, that, like, that, I was spurred on by that loss because I knew I won. So it wasn't like a loss. You know, I knew I won. And so many people had agreed with me, as we said. And, like, it, it made it much easier seeing that and seeing how I've changed in the, like, fucking worldwide known, like, overnight. And, you know, this time, in, as a pro, when I was a pro, and the two losses I've had, I've been in front of, know tens of thousands of people and and then you know hundreds of thousands if not millions worldwide and when they're watching it then when you lose you're losing in in, in man to man combat and that's something uh, us as as primal beings that it's one of the first instincts isn't it the fate fate or flight then you know the fact that when you lose that how do you actually feel and when you're doing that in front of so many people and then now with the world we live in, you have social media where everybody has an opinion and not everybody's opinion matters, but me being a guy on social media, I see it and it's hard. It's not nice and you have people who want, just want to kick you when you're down and just talk shit about you and say everything and criticize you. And then even like I, even leaving the house and stuff after losing is, is always a nightmare for me. I just don't want to see nobody. I don't want to speak nobody. I don't want people to come up to me and go, they're hard looking to fight and going, I don't I just don't talk to me. <laughs> just leave yeah. me alone. It's hard. Um embarrassing. You know, the how I've dealt with the last two the two defeats. So one was March twenty twenty two, the second defeat was May twenty twenty three and there was two fights in between them. I obviously won, but you know, those two losses, the first one, I went away to Portugal for a month right away, I just left and went to Portugal and for the first week, I didn't move from the room. My missus was like, come down and play with the kids and stuff. I'm like, no, because I'm not doing that. I'm staying here. And I was properly really down. But because of that was a fight of the year and the performance and everything up until the point which where I lost, you know, was unbelievable. It wasn't as bad to take the last one because I didn't perform and because I was beaten by the better man on the night. It was just very, very hard to swallow. And I actually considered just going done. Can't do it. Can go through this again and have to do that build up towards another world title again and go through the fights, the fights which you know you have to have in the in, in the spaces in between to get to that world title. Um and the training camps. You know I'm away in training camp for twelve weeks at a time. That last one, sixteen weeks, probably overtrained in a sense, but like that's away from my my young kids. You know I'm missing birthdays and missing everything. Almost missed my daughter's communion, but she wouldn't allow me, so I had to fly back. But uh, yeah, it's like yeah, I was considering retiring because I was like, I don't think I can do this again. And having to go through this 
if I was to lose again and that feeling again, it's very, very hard to take. But it took me in the immediate after that one. Um, so I fought on Saturday on the Tuesday. Um, my missus had booked Disneyland Paris for the kids, so I had to go to Disneyland. And I was probably the last place I needed to be for those. I was mad, mad, like down and depressed. But it took me three days in Disneyland to realize that no, I need to go back to boxing. I need to get the nerd training camp here. Um, I can't be staying in Disney. So, um, I just had a sit down with a family, sit down with you know people close to me, and we spoke and asked the questions. Do you still think I can be world champion? Um, what do you think I need to change? Uh, I think my brother and stuff I asked and people who are, are most honest with me. Um, and I got the answer I wanted and that's why I had to say that I wanted to continue. I think there's a lesson in that for everything. Life is, we all face adversity. Everybody, everybody listening here, number one, as a man, I can identify you went into your cave. Yeah, And I feel sometimes that's the best as a man. We have to hide somewhere. I don't know why that is, and I'm sure people have written about it. But then the second point is you reached out to your family because you can always depend on them. Yeah. And they're always there. Yeah. Yeah. It's important that we have that fallback. Um, I'm just conscious of time. And so you have made your decision now and you're going back into the world of boxing so you allowed the time to pass almost and you you got external advice which gave you a different perspective again a lot of men don't reach out to other people though when things are going wrong it's important isn't it to have a sounding board i'm i'm not someone who hates my emotions as you can see at the olympic interviews and stuff but in general i don't hate emotions if i feel a certain way i'll say it and I'll say it to whether it be my missus, my brother, or anything, or my mother or anything, I'll say it and I'll let people know how I'm feeling. I'm not going to be, I'm not the guy who, who builds everything up and then you know, does something stupid. You know, I, I, I express my feelings a lot. Um, So people who, who know me will know how I feel and, and, and know when it's, when they approach me or not. They approach me like, it's probably, you know, it's, it's, it's a great attribute to have, but also a bad attribute to have because, if I like you, you'll know I like you. If I don't like you, you'll know I don't like you. And I and that's probably where I should probably learn to hate things a little bit more. But um, I'm just honest and 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 straight. And even with emotions and feelings, I express them. I don't I don't hate them. And you know, I think that was the right thing to do was send it off to people who who mean most, not just anybody, just the people who mean most to me and whose opinions I value most. Um, and when I got the the answers, which was the, I had to be honest answers because. As I said earlier in, in the podcast, boxing is a very dangerous game and you can't be in a half assed. And one thing about me, I'm not I'm not I don't go into things half assed, I go into things head on hundred percent in. Um if I'm if, if I'm not, I'm not in it. As simple as that. So, you know, I, 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 I let the time pass, you know, bit of rest, bit of bit of rest and digest and just enjoy life. For the first time in a long time, you know, for having this moment the time off, um, it feels a bit weird at times, but you know, it's definitely needed. Uh, but yeah, um, having the time off, rest, thought about things, weigh things up, and decided that I'll continue, but I need to make some changes. Do you follow your gut? Always, always. And always in this follow. instance, yeah. And, and the next steps are going to be scary like you know what I mean it's like I'm making big changes I'm, I'm changing coach I'm, I'm changing probably location of where I'm training so that means I'll be even further I could be training in, most likely in America again so I'll be even further away from my family because I'm not going to take my kids out of school um, so yes there are big changes you're going to make and you know, there, there are the things which I think is probably needed at this moment in time know something that is going to scare you and to make it worthwhile it needs you need to have that fear plus you'll have a psychological break from the past yeah you're going fresh everything yeah. is anew yeah. so it's a time for a new beginning definitely definitely michael Carlin, it was a pleasure talking to you you're an absolute gentleman always patrick it's always been brilliant good stuff thanks very much cheers mate take care 
Thank you for listening to the Oxygen Advantage podcast. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and maybe take the time to leave us a review. The Oxygen Advantage podcast is available from all your podcast providers.